thing to George Bailey? Help him, dear father. Joseph, Jesus, and Mary, help my friend, Mr. Bailey. Help my son, George, tonight. He never thinks about himself, God. That's why he's in trouble. George is a good guy. Give him a break, God. I love him, dear Lord. Watch over him tonight. Please, God, something's the matter with Daddy. Please bring Daddy back. informal survey. How many of you have seen It's a Wonderful Life? Let me see how many of you have actually seen the movie. How, how many of you have not seen It's a Wonderful Life? Just raise your hand real quickly. All right. For those of you that have never seen It's a Wonderful Life, that was, this, this is the, a video clip from the movie uh, from that, uh, that era. The movie is 60, 70 years old, something like that now. And uh, that was a clip, and, and, and it, was a, it, was a, it was a series of clips throughout the first, I don't know, two-thirds of the movie. But you get the gist from the very beginning of the movie, and it starts out with a man who's being prayed for. There was friends and neighbors and city people and family and spouse that were praying, Oh God, please be with George. Be with George Bailey. Be with George Bailey. He's so distraught that he's actually saying, God, I don't know if you're even there. He said, but if you'll hear me. And we find him at the end of the, the illustration, at the very beginning of the illustration, we, we find him concluding and he's standing there with a decision in front of him. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah chapter 9. And I also want you to go to the book of John. In this passage of Scripture and in this story that we're going to be talking about this morning, I want you to understand that it is a wonderful life. Christmas is coming. Christmas is right around the corner. We all suffer. We learned last week, if you were here and heard Pastor Tony Cook minister, you, you heard the fact that we all experience difficult times. And he really had no idea where I was going in my message. So he kind of set the ball up ready for me to spike it. Because ultimately, the goal in life is to let you know that though you might be in the midst of difficult times, though there might be individuals praying that you might be able to make it, God wants you to understand that he came that you might laugh have life and have a wonderful life. 
It's a wonderful life that Jesus has provided, and I want you to embrace it. You know, as a church, as a pastor, there is a passion in my heart is that people don't just go to church because it's the right thing to do. They don't just go to church because, hey, that's what you do on Sunday. They don't just go to church because it's their duty to Jesus to go to church. They come to church or they live a life that is rich and full and exciting that represents Christ in every arena. Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6. It says, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called what? Wonderful. His name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Turn with me if you will, real quickly. Keep your passage right there in Isaiah. But go with me now to the book of John. Go with me, if you will, to John chapter 10. I'm going to give you a moment to find it. Whether you have electronic te- uh, uh, a phone or whether or not you use the old-fashioned, turn the page. But I want you to go to John chapter 10, verse number 10, and I want to read this passage. I'm going to, I'm going to give you the second portion of it. We know what the enemy came to do, but the Bible says that Jesus said, I came at Christmas time. Can I put that in there? I came at Christmas time. That they may have life. Say life. That they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. And I just pray over the few short moments that we have together, Lord, that we be able to articulate, God, what you have in my heart about embracing this wonderful life that Jesus came that we might have. Father, so often Christmas gets convoluted with all of the stuff, but Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said in John 10.10, He said, I came that you might have. Say have. That word have means to hold, to possess, to, to wear, and be closely joined to life. Jesus came that you might, let me read it this way, hold and possess and wear and be closely joined to this life that he came for you to have. So often what we do is we dance with life and we dance out of life. We step into life and we step out of life. Circumstances, situations, trials and tribulations. Oh, I need Jesus. I'll get some life now. But when we're doing fine... Yesterday, a church member woke up to a tree down across three vehicles in their front yard. How many of you know that's a moment you make a decision whether or not I'm going to have life or I'm going to just be desperate for God for a moment? You either walk in life or you don't. You know, Christmas has so many different traditions. And as I was thinking about different traditions, how many of you guys have like an advent calendar that starts you know, on the 1st of December, and it may have an ornament you put in it. It may have a little doorway you open it. How many of you have one of those? All right, everybody has one of those. We have one, and when my kids were both home, they fought over who got to flip the thing or open the door or hang the ornament. And I don't know what it's like in your house, but, but there's orn- there, there, was a, there was a calendar. Some families, it's putting up a tree a certain way. Amen? Some people... How many of you put your lights on first? Tree goes up, lights go on first. All right. How many of you put your your lights on last? Anybody? All right. How about the garland? Does the garland go first or does the garland go last? There are traditions about how you put things together. Maybe making Christmas candies or cookies or treats. Some of you know, maybe you do it the week before. Maybe you do it Christmas Eve. Maybe that's part of your daily Christmas tradition. Others, how, how many of you are Christmas Eve folks? How many of you are Christmas Eve folks? That's the day all the presents get to open. How many of you are Christmas Eve folks? All right. How many of you are Christmas morning? How many of you are Christmas morning? All right. That's the way it is in my house. For those of you that are Christmas Eve, I never could understand how Santa got to your place first. (laughs) Never made any sense to me. But but it it may be watching your Christmas movie. I've watched two Christmas movies so far already. I watch them every year for Christmas. I watched It's a Wonderful Life. Actually, I started to watch three, but I didn't get to watch that that third one. But I've watched It's a Wonderful Life, and I've watched uh, White Christmas. I watched White Christmas just the other day. How many of you like those movies? You enjoy those movies? Good. 
You know, I was thinking about it. I, I came across an illustration, a, a Sunday school teacher. A Sunday school teacher uh, asked the classroom one time, and they asked this question, what is Christmas all about? What is Christmas all about? And many of the kids had the answers. It's about Jesus coming, right? How, how many of you know it's about getting this fullness of joy? But yet there was another bo- little child in the room and says, well, sometimes for Christmas you don't get what you, always, what you want. Have you ever opened up a Christmas present and went, oh, thanks. <laughs> Anybody ever get that gift? You open that gift and you go, yeah, that one's really nice. I appreciate that. Thanks. Dads, you got, the, you, got the, you got the Santa tie that you were required to wear to the Christmas Eve service or whatever it was. You remember what I'm talking about? But, but, but how many of you know that, that there are gifts sometimes you get that you don't want? There are gifts that you get. You know, USA Today did a survey once. Do you realize this? That 31%, even if you get a gift that you don't want, 31% of you will keep it. 30% of you will hide it. 13% of you will toss it. 12% of you will re-gift it or give it away. None of you's never done that before, have you? You've never re-gifted a gift before, have you? And 6% of you will return it. Now, my wife and I, we have this little thing. We, 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 we struggle every year. I think we do fairly well, but there was this one year I bought, I mean, all kinds of gifts for my wife. 100% of those gifts went back to the store. I didn't do well that day at all. But you know what? I don't get offended because I, I tell my wife on the front end, if you don't like it, don't worry about it. I'm not, I'd, rather you, I'd rather you return it than keep it and toss it, keep it, hide it, give it away, you know, that kind of thing. But during the holidays, it can be a rat race. And we miss this wonderful life that Jesus came for us. You know, in the midst of this gift... The story, of, the story of It's a Wonderful Life, the movie, it's a story of George Bailey. George Bailey is just a common man. He grew up in this town. His father owned a, a, a local building and loan. Never, never were very prosperous. In fact, they lived on the edge of broke all the time. But this, in this movie, the, the, the movie depicts how, how George was a dreamer. He had grand aspirations to accomplish incredible things. He wanted to be a global traveler, never wanted to get married. But his father gets sick. And with his father getting sick and dying, he ends up taking over the building alone and allows his brother to go out and become a war hero. He allows other people to accomplish things. And and he begins to manage life, but yet never experiencing life. And so often we, we do this in our own life. We can be very much like George Bailey in the fact that, that we go and we punch our ticket, we wake up, we get out of bed, we get our showers, we have our breakfast, grab our coffee, we go to work, we come home. We, it may, you know, it's just an ordinary life. But somewhere along the line, that ordinary becomes draining. Well, in the story, you find that without telling you everything about the story, because I want to encourage you to go see it. But there's this moment where they lose some money. And he's so distraught because he doesn't know what to do. He has no idea, and he's willing to do something so that his family, he would not have to deal with the pain and the suffering and the sorrow of what has taken place. See, the, the climax of this movie arrives with George evaluating a gift that he wasn't sure he wanted anymore. And that was just simply the gift of life. You know what? I, I, would, I would venture to say that most of us in our lives, we have not considered what the Word of God has to say. I've, I've thought about a scripture here that I wanted to share with you, and they don't have it up, up there, but I put it into my notes this morning. It says in the book of 1 Corinthians... I want to read this passage to you. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 9, it says, As it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love them. 
It says this, But God hath revealed them to us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of the man that is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. Jesus came that we might experience the very life and the very wonderful life that he designed for us. But the, but the reality is for most of us, we don't experience this life that God has. We miss what God has. God said right here, I has not seen nor ear heard what God has in store for you. What, is the, what are the things that God has in store for you? You know, Far too often, many of us, like George, we may not get to the place where we're going to quit. But how many of you know your individuals are not alone in the Word of God? There are people in the Bible that set the tone and set the temperature for you and I as examples so that our lives can be rich and full and move beyond what we currently are experiencing. As a matter of fact, as I was thinking about this, how many of you know life can be hard? Life can be difficult. Life can be challenging. And when you come into Christmas and you lay the stresses of Christmas on top of it, it just gets harder and harder. Maybe there's a stress at your job. Maybe, maybe there's a stress with your children. Maybe there's a stress with your spouse. Maybe there's a stress in your finances. Maybe there's a stress in your school. Maybe there's something coming up like finals. How many of you know finals are coming up? Where's my high school kids? Those are coming up, what, in the next week or so? In the next week. But you know what? How often? Some people want to quit it. Some people want to quit this life. Some people want to just say, God, I'm throwing in the towel. I'm done. I'm finished. You know what? Serving you hasn't been all that. He never said that when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and personal Savior, everything was going to be awesome. It's not the Lego movie. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Where the little dude runs around and sings, everything is awesome. <laughs> All of my youth and my kids know that song, right? Right? But some people want to quit it. This wonderful life. This wonderful life that, 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 that we've decored our stage. That you're planning in your house. How many of you done with your Christmas shopping? Everybody done? Anybody done? I'm done. I got it done. Hallelujah. But you know what? Some people want to quit it throughout Scripture, like George Bailey. There were characters who want to quit. I just randomly picked a few folks. But how about this? How about we talk about Jeremiah for a minute? He felt taken advantage of. He felt taken advantage of. It says in Jeremiah 20, verse 9, he says, Then I said, Jeremiah said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more of his name. Do you realize that, that Jeremiah got to this place about God and in his relationship with God? He said, I'm not going to talk about him anymore. I'm not going to talk about him anymore. I mean, have, you ever, have any of you ever gotten to that place where you said, God, you know what? You asked me to do this. I've been faithful. I've put my hand to it. And it feels like you left me. I feel like I've been taken advantage of you. None of you have ever been, felt that way at your job and your family. And your, none of you have ever felt that way. But, but, but Jeremiah felt taken advantage of by his own God. I love how the passage continues, but he says, no, nah, I can't do it. But I wanted you to see that he actually made the statement. So not only did, did Jeremiah feel taken advantage of, there's another fellow in there, and his name is Job. He had a sense of abandonment. He said, my soul is weary of my life. I will leave my complaint upon myself, and I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. He says, I am weary with my life. None of you have ever been there. None of you have ever had that anxiety. None of you have ever had that thought. I'm weary of my life. Job made the statement, I'm weary of my life. There was a thought that passed his mind, whether it was instant or whether it was elongated. He thought for a moment, God, you've abandoned me. Where are you in this thing? Where are you in all of this? How about this? Elijah thought the same thing. He didn't feel abandoned. He didn't necessarily feel that he was taken advantage of. But he was under attack. 
Might be in your physical body, might be in your finances, might be in your relationships. I don't know, but in 1 Kings, it makes this statement. And he, being Elijah, requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, O Lord, now, O Lord, take away my life. I think it's in there. Yep, it's in the middle. He said, take away my life. He was under attack. Ahab and Jezebel were on his heels. They were coming for him. Guys, I don't know about you, but, but there are moments in all of our lives that we feel like we're under attack. Might be somebody close to us. Might be somebody that's a, that hired us. It might be, might be some. you know what? Hopefully it's never but in the church. I hope not. But we can all feel like we're under attack. George Bailey felt abandoned. George, George Bailey felt like he, was, like he was taken advantage of. He felt like he was under attack. How about this? This is the scary one because Gideon made an accusation toward God. And Gideon said unto him, Oh my Lord, if the Lord is really with us, why has this all befallen us? God, if you're really there, See, Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. That we might have, that we might wear, that we might be able to put on what we're talking about, this possession to be closely joined to this life in Christ. But so oftentimes we get sidetracked by the other stuff. We felt like we've been taken advantage of. We felt a sense of abandonment. We feel ourselves under attack and maybe we've even accused God before. Pastor Bob, this is a Christmas message. No, it's just real. Is it okay if I just get real today? Because really, when we talk about Christmas, we have to talk about the purpose of why Christmas was established for us. Why did Jesus ultimately come? Jesus came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. There are so many individuals in the Word of God that we can look at, but Jesus came that we might experience a wonderful life. Jesus came to give it. Jesus came to give it. Not only, not only do we understand that some want to quit it, but Jesus came to give it. You know, as I was thinking about this, Jesus never wanted us to quit life. But, but I think oftentimes what happens is, is we oftentimes, we will measure this abundant life by stuff. We measure this abundant life by our feelings and by our emotions and how our body responds. That's not, abundant life. That's not abundant life. Now, did Jesus come for those things? Sure he did. We know from passage and passage and passage and passage that if there's something going on in my physical body, God wants to make that right. We believe in divine healing at Lighthouse Church. Amen? Amen. Anybody else agree with me about that? But what is this abundant life? See, he wants us to embrace life. As I was doing my study this week about this thing called wonderful life, uh, this thing called life, there are really three areas that we find in the New Testament, three words that are used to describe life. And I'm going to go all Greek on you for just a minute. And I don't often do this for you, but I'm going to go all Greek on you for just a minute. Because I want you to understand these three arenas that we often tend to navigate and what we call life. Does that make sense? Because what we tend to do is we tend to combine them all together. And we tend to call them all one. Life meaning one thing. But in the Greek, they actually defined life three different ways. They, 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 they described life in the realm of the physical, our physical body. They defined, uh, they defined life in the realm of your will, your mind, your will and emotions. And then they defined life by your spirit. Amen? And so when we talk about these three, I want you to understand the first one is bios. Bios is the physical realm of the word life. So when you read your Bible, like in Luke chapter 8 and verse 14, it says, And that which fell among the thorns are they, which when they have heard it, they go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life. This is the physical life they're talking about. 
Does God want you to have nice things? Absolutely. Does God want you blessed in the financial realm? Yes. Does God want to bring increase to your life? Absolutely, 100%. But when that becomes the definition of our life and the pursuit of our life is stuff, guess what? We're not really experiencing life. Because even in this particular passage, he says there are those that that the cares of this life and the riches and the pleasures of this life and they bring no fruit to perfection. In other words, what he's saying is, how many of you have ever, you've you've strived for it, you've fought for it, you've saved for it, you got it, and about a a week later, you're like, man, it's just no, no big deal. Anybody? I've been that way. I think I've shared the story. I think I've shared the illustration with you. Man, I believed God. I believed God for a year for a Lincoln Navigator. It's a big SUV truck. Believed God for a year. And guess what? I got it. But within about a month, it was just a truck that was sucking about three to $400 in gas a month. The payment was $582.36. I remember it. My insurance was over $100 a month. I was paying $1,000 a month for that thing called life. Sold it in 11 months. Because as much as I love that vehicle, guess what? I thought that defined my life. The bios. that That was the physical arena of my life. The second realm would be this, and that's the suke. P S U C H E. This is the soulish realm. This is your mind and your will and your emotions. This is the area that that, that what we begin to find in Matthew chapter 16, verse 25. He says, For whosoever shall save his life, who will save his life will lose it, and whoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. He's talking about your mind, your will, and emotions. Why is he why is he say you gotta give up your life? You gotta give up what you're thinking for the things that he's thinking. See, what happens is is what we do is we have a tendency, and I was talking to somebody about this just before service, we have a tendency to to look at this Bible and say, God, in my life, I want to find the verses that I can set upon my life and bring blessing. And so what happens is we read this book in light of what we already believe rather than let this book change and alter and correct what we believe. See, oftentimes I can read a verse in there and I can get all happy and everything because it goes along with my personality. But when I find a verse in there that I don't like, guess what he's telling me in this passage? He's telling me, he said, I need to lose that life, that way of thinking, that way of believing and take on his way of thinking, his way of believing, and then all of a sudden there's a different kind of life I'm going to experience. See, when, when, when people come against you, when adversaries come against you, you have to recognize and know that there is an enemy seeking who, whom he may devour. But this last de- de- definition of life is what Jesus came to provide, and it's called Zoe. Say Zoe. Zoe is the abundant faithfulness of life both essential and ethical, which belongs to God. It's the God kind of life. It's the eternal life. It's the divine life of God. It's the God kind of life existence. See, when I grasp the God kind of life, why did Jesus come as a baby in the manger? Why did He come wrapped in the simplest of clothes? Why did He come with no no pomp or circumstance, without dignity or honor or position or fanfare? It's because of the fact that He understood that in all of that is not life, but it's in Him that there is life and Him alone. See, the world was missing something that was desperately needed. Did Jesus come for, the phys- for our physical bodies? Yes. But was that the only reason he came? No. Did, did Jesus come for our mind and our will and our emotions? The answer is yes. But was that the only and primary reason that he came? No. Why did he come? Why do we celebrate and put trees up? Why do we celebrate look, the, the star afar off? Why do we talk about a babe in a manger? Why do we have Christmas celebrations and Christmas programs? It's because there was a Jesus that came that you might have life and have it abundantly. 
See, so oftentimes we have gifts under the tree. How many of you put your, tree, your gifts under the tree before Christmas? Anybody do that? My, my parents didn't put a single stick of tree at Christmas under the tree, so we didn't have any idea where they were. We didn't know where they hit them and all that kind of stuff. But you know what? When I look at the gift that Jesus came to give, it's not about a baby in a manger. It's not about a tree. It's not about a donkey. It's not about a no room in the inn. Although those are things that are important and aspects of the story. He came that he might give you a gift. He came that he might have a gift that, that would be a gift that would be far beyond and far more valuable and far more precious than what the world thought they needed. See, at the, in the day, they thought that the Messiah was going to come and he was going to be the redeemer of mankind in this way, that he was going to set up this kingdom that says the Romans, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Chaldeans, all of the people, the Egyptians, all of the people that had imprisoned and put them into bondage, they, no, nah, this one was going to trump them all. And he didn't come that way. Have you ever gotten a gift? And, and just think about this for just a minute, the, is, the children of Israel. It's like they got a gift, but it wasn't a gift they wanted. They didn't want a gift that was eternal. They didn't want a gift. They, they wanted a gift that was going to say, you know what? We've been in bondage all these years. We want to be in control now. They were, they, were, they were contemplating the bios life. They were contemplating the suke life. They weren't contemplating eternal life. And see, that's, that's the gift that when we think about these things, he came to redeem us from death in our spirit. There is a wonderful life, and he longed for us to experience this gift that had been absent from mankind. Just got a few things that I want to share with you, and we're going to get ready to close this thing out. But in Isaiah chapter 11, verse number 5, talking about this Wonderful life. The prophet Isaiah prophesied and he says, And there shall come forth a rod of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow from his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. Earth, and he shall be he shall smite the earth and and with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked and with righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins verse 10 and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand as a sign for the people to it shall the Gentiles seek and his rest shall be glorious John chapter 1 verse number 4 it says, in him, this stem, this, this stump, this bump of Jesse, depending on what translation you read, was life. Jesus came that we might have life. In him was a life. And the life, Zoe, was the light of man. Christmas is not about returnable gifts. It's, it's not about eggnog and parties and decorations and, uh, or the Christmas tree. It's about one thing, experiencing Zoe life. When we look at the Word and we understand the Word, it was about a wonderful life so that often we often allow to remain like a gift still wrapped and unused. And so many Christians, I, I find that they've received Christ, but they've never unpacked the Zoe of God. They've never unpacked this life, this eternal divine nature that God wants us to have that was given to us so many years ago at Christmas. It remains packaged. How many of you parents, when a package leaves, is left unopened, you kind of wonder, well, maybe they're happy and they're satisfied. And I think what happens is a lot of Christians are not happy and they're not satisfied, but it's like there's a wrapped package under the tree saying, hey, open me, open me, but they're not doing it. Because there's so much more 
than what we're currently experiencing. We fight every day with our job. We fight every day with our boss. We fight every day to obtain and receive. But John says this. John said, for God so loved the world that he gave everlasting zoe. Romans says this. That, that, that Paul said the, the sin results in death, but the gift of God is eternal zoe. Throughout Scripture, we find that Jesus came to provide something that eluded mankind. The faithfulness of life, the fullness of life is incomplete without Christ. The peaceful life escapes us without Christ. The light of life is overshadowed without Christ. The kind of life is impossible with life. The God kind of life is impossible without Christ. We try to experience peace, fulfillment, and abundance through this bios and suke, but God said, no, that's not how it comes. It comes through zoe. It comes through experiencing the life of God. It's a wonderful life and God wants you to embrace it. It's a wonderful life and, and God desperately wants the believer in the church to receive it. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, and the old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But this is what's really cool. It tells us in Colossians chapter 3, it says this. It says, And have embraced this new nature, this, this new creature, this new person that God gave us, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of Him who created it. We have embraced this new nature. Say, I've embraced it. I've embraced this nature. And then he said in, Thess in, in Ephesians, he says, and to be transformed as you embrace the glorious Christ within as your new life, Zoe, and life, Zoe, in union with Him. For God has recreated you all over again in His perfect righteousness. And you now belong to Him in the realm of true holiness. Pastor Dexter, why don't you come real quick? As we get ready to close, there are three things. Three things that we can do to walk in Zoe. Three things. This is, this is the wonderful life that God wants us to have. It's this, it's this life that God desires for you and for me. Number one, is rather than quitting it, we need to embrace it. See, now, now I'm going to talk to my young people for just a minute because I know that sometimes in school, being a Christian is not cool. I get that. So what, what happens is we, end, we have a tendency to systematically accept it, quit it, accept it, quit it, depending on who we're around. Your families maybe are that way. And rather than quitting this wonderful life that God has given to you, we need to at some point step all in and get fully engaged. What, what am I talking about when I, when I talk about this quit, rather than quitting it, we need to embrace it. Don't be a George Bailey. Say, I'm not going to be a George Bailey. So often our thoughts get us into trouble. Our thoughts will eventually become actions. And if we, re, if we exalt things against this wonderful life of God, how can we ever embrace it fully? Jesus made this statement in 2 Corinthians 10.5. He said this, we're supposed to cast down every imagination. We're supposed to remove every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And bring into captivity every thought into the obedience of Christ. Number two. Number one, you're supposed to, rather than quit it, you're supposed to brace it. But number two, we're supposed to fix our focus on the one who gave it. We're supposed to fix our focus on the one who gave it. As I've been studying and reading this whole month about just kind of renewing. If, you, if you've been doing it, I've been doing it. But, but in Luke, just reading a, a chapter a day, there's been a newness that has just come over me because I've read the whole thing in light of Christmas. Where's your focus? Where's your focus? See, when we get our eyes on the wrong things, we no longer have a clear picture of what we have and what we've been given. We, we, we start living a life in 
our physical realm, where we start living a life or trying to obtain a life in our, in our mind, in our will, in our emotions, but we're not experiencing abundant life because the abundant life comes in that eternal life, the focus upon that eternal life. George couldn't see past his present situation, but Christ, knowing what was set before him, came to provide us a wonderful life we could not have without him. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 says this in the Amplified Translation, looking away from all that distracts us and focusing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of faith, the first incentive of our belief, and the one who brings our faith to maturity. Who for the joy of accomplishing the goal set before him endured the cross, disregarded the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, revealing his deity, his authority, and his completion of his work. Number three, I want you to understand this. You need to change how you talk. Man, I, if, this, this, if there's one thing I wish especially coming into the holidays. Weariness will change how you talk. Anger will change how you talk. Frustration will change how you talk. But when you're experiencing the fullness of Zoe, the Zoe life of God, you speak Zoe. You speak life. The problem is so many of us in the church have stopped speaking Zoe. We're speaking in light of Suke. We're speaking in light of Bios rather than speaking in light of Zoe. We don't know what to do. We're a Pentecostal church sometimes. How many of you have ever prayed and said, God, I don't know what to do anymore. I'm, I'm at the end of my rope. I, I'm frustrated. I don't think there's another thing I can do. I don't know if I can hang on. See, what we begin doing is we're looking at life in light of Bios and Suke not in light of Zoe. If he is greater inside of you, if he is more than a conqueror, if he is an overcomer, are we partnering with that in what we speak and in what we say? The more we embrace the gift of life begun at Christmas, the more we learn and yearn to learn more. The word Zoe appears in your New Testament 135 times. It's something that we ought to know about. It's something we ought to pay attention to. The word Zoe appears that many times. When was the last time you spoke Zoe into your situation? Proverbs tells us death and life are in the power of the tongue. John tells us this, the Spirit gives life and flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Say life. James chapter 3, verse 10 says this, And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of this same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this isn't right. Just so you know, Clarence, the angel, jumped in the water. Most of you didn't see it, but he was that funny little fellow right there next to George. Clarence jumps in the water to save George. There's only one that can save you. There's only one that can deliver you. There's only one that can heal you. There's only one that can provide the peace that's necessary for you. The only one that provides the Zoe kind of life is Jesus himself. He desires that you experience the Zoe kind of life. Would you stand to your feet? We're going to get ready to sing a song. And I want you to really evaluate your life. Have I been living my life in light of Bios and Suke or have I been living it in light of Zoe? Because coming into Christmas is about Zoe. It's not about those other things. There might be those of you in the room that have a gift and the gift of Zoe and you've left it unpacked or unopened. As you evaluate your life in the current place that you are right now, are you experiencing the wonderful life Jesus came at Christmas for you to have? If not... I want you to make a decision. 
Pastor Dexter's going to sing a song, but maybe you've not experienced Zoe because there's sin in your life and you need to repent. Maybe, maybe you might have to change how you're thinking. Maybe you might have to believe that God has a life that is better than the life you are striving for. And you might have to separate yourself from the life stealers that have robbed you for so long. You might have to forgive others or maybe even yourself to begin to experience Zoe. I want you to come to the altar and I just want you to have a time with God. So Dexter, would you lead us in a song? And I'm just going to pray for you when you get here. If you want to come forward and you just want to experience a new level of Zoe in your life, just come forward. It's okay. Hallelujah. You make all things new. Hallelujah. You make all things new. You make all things new. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, yeah. Oh, come to the altar. The Father, arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus. Christ. Leave behind. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Cause Jesus is calling. Come bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born, Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the
Savior. Come on, sing it, church. Isn't he one? No one else, nobody else, nobody else. In the name of Jesus, Christ is risen. We bow our hearts, bow our hearts, and bow down before Him. For He is Lord. your voice is worship worship the Lord oh how oh, what a wonderful you are to me I will sing hallelujah we magnify you in this place we ask Heavenly Father <laughs> yeah hallelujah <laughs> the Lord kept telling me over and over as I was praying for these three individuals and I'm not going to tell you what I prayed for them but this is what I sense in the room and we're going to close with this there are those of you that have been in this room and you've lived your life as a Christian. You've lived your life pursuing God. You pray in other tongues. You do prayer. You serve in the church. But you've tried to fulfill your life through the bios and the suke. That's man-made. Jesus said to you, I came that you might have life, you might have zoe, you might have the divine nature, the deposit. There might be a weight in the process, there might be a journey in that season, but I'm telling you right now, God has a life for you that is far beyond whatever you could create, hope, dream, or imagine. Quit doing it on your own. Young people, Listen to me, you're trying to plan your life. But the only way you're going to experience abundant life is through the Zoe of God. You got to give at some point. You got to say, God, I give up. I can't do this by myself. Because everything that you've tried, I bet, hasn't fully come to light. Just give. So, Father, as we get ready to close this service, little different Christmas service. But God, I believe right now, Lord, that you've called us to a wonderful life. I believe, Lord, that you've destined us for a purpose. I believe every person in this room under the sound of my voice, whether they're watching online or they're in this place, God, you've called them to live a Zoe kind of life. And Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that where man has failed and fallen short, God, you never fail and you never fall short. 
Your promises are yes and amen, and they're always fulfilled. But if I pursue it outside of Zoe, you're not obligated. Father, I thank you and I praise you, Lord, as we leave. I pray that the Spirit of God would be upon us. I pray that we'd walk under the unction and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I pray, Heavenly Father, that the fullness of God would be made manifest in us and through us and that as people see us and experience us, they encounter us, they find something that they're desperately seeking. God, we're not interested in having an amazing Sunday church service. We're interested in building amazing Christians Monday through Saturday. And so God, help us this week. Set your angels around about us. Watch over and protect us. Keep us safe, Heavenly Father. And God, we magnify you in all that you are. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. If you want to, make sure you stop by and sign up. We need people for prayer. We love you guys. Take care.